Okay, so I think we're all set. Um, uh, as I said earlier, you guys can't talk unless I unmute you. So, and I can't see you either. So you don't have to worry about like unmuting your mic. You guys can't talk. So this is a webinar. Okay. So I'm just gonna start sharing my screen so that I can start with the presentation. Okay. So today is our second class. And today we'll be talking about God, uh, gods and demigods. Last week we talked about the creation of the world and the Olympians. So today we're gonna continue with other gods, slightly less important, but for some cultures still very important and some demigods. Okay, so today's agenda will be like kind of similar to last class, but we're gonna separate each gods and demigods into categories. So the first category will be the deities of art. And then we're gonna talk about the deities of nature, the deities of love, and then the marginal deities. And then at the end, we're gonna do a Kahoot because a lot of you liked it last time. Okay, so, okay. Um, okay, so we're going to start with the deities of art. So the first god we're going to talk about is Dioniso Dionysos or Bacchus. He is the god of vines or and wine, and he's the god of theater. So like in this picture, we can see his attributes are vine leaves, grapes, a cup, a thirst, which is... Um, a stick with a pine cone at the end, like in this picture right over here, and the animal, the panther. And his cortege, his cortege, uh, basically the group of people around him is the demigod Pan, Phonus, the satyrs, and then we have the maenads or the bacchants. So let's talk about the first, let's talk about the demigod Pan. Pan is the god of shepherds, which means that he protects all of the, the animal shepherds, which are a kind of dog. And his attributes are a human with horns and goat legs, which we can see over here. And he often has like a little flute. And then we have the satyrs. Satyrs are basically, look basically the same as Pan, but they are like the groups, uh, his group, like his cordage. They are rustic fertility spirits of the countryside and wilds. So they follow Pan, basically. And then we have um, Phonus. Sorry, I'm just gonna... Yeah, um, we, we have Phonus. Phonus is Saturn's grandchild. Last time I talked about Saturn, Saturn can also be called Kronos. Uh, he is, Kronos is um, the Olympian's father. And then, so Phonos, is the deity of countryside. So countryside includes everything from fields, forests, plains, rivers, etc. And he's also the deity of fertility and the protector of herds. Herds normally include like sheep or um, like all kinds of animals like that. And so the attributes is also a human with horns and goat legs. He basically looks the same as Pan and other satyrs. Okay, so, and then we're gonna talk about the maenads or the pecans. They are female followers of Dionysos and stricken by mystical delirium who roam the countryside shouting, dancing, and playing music. So basically, um, Dionysos is always drinking wine, uh, wine so, which is why he, like, we can say that he likes to have like a party. And so the maenads are the women who follow him around. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the nine muses. Muses are Zeus and Mnemosyne's daughters. They are nine deities personifying the arts that inspire writers and artists. So for example, if I want to write a story, I will call upon the nine muses or any muses that I would like to communicate with and 
hope they inspire me while I'm writing, uh, while I'm writing my story. So the first one we're going to talk about is Calliope. Calliope is the muse of epic poetry. And then we have Cleo, which is the muse of story. Arado, which is the muse of lyric poetry. Uderp, which is the muse of music. And then we have Thalia, the muse of comedy. Urania is the muse of astronomy. Melpomen is the muse of strategy and singing. And then we have Polyhymnia is the muse of hymns and sacred poetry. And lastly, we have Terpishore, which is the muse of choral singing and dancing. So as you can see on the right side of my PowerPoint, each um, muse has her different um, attributes. So for example, we have, um, for example, we have Cleo, which is story. So we can see she's holding a book. Or for example, we have Urania, she is the muse of astronomy and we can see she has a globe in her hand. And same goes for all the other muses. And then we're gonna talk about the deity of nature. So the first one we're gonna talk about is Helios or Sol. He is the god of the sun and his attributes are the flying chariot and it's his radiant crown. Um, the, uh, the flying chariot is attached to the sun, which is why how um, the Romans and the Greek explain day and night is during the day, Helios will ride his flying chariot and um, streak the sun across the sky during day. And then at night, he'll be sleeping. So there's no sun at all. And then uh, he's also associated with Phoebus. Phoebus is the personification of the, the sun. So basically he is the sun. And so the myth we're going to talk about is the myth of Phaeton. Phaeton is Helios's son. So the myth basically goes as um, Phaeton, one time he wanted to impress village, uh, the people in his village. So he asked his father if he could write his flag chariot. And then since he was too proud to admit that he didn't know how to fly a chariot, he didn't listen to any of his any of his father's instructions. So when he started flying it, the uh, the horses wouldn't listen to him. So the uh, the chariot started spiraling down towards the earth. And then so it burned a lot of the earth. And then at one point, Zeus saw what was happening to the earth. So he struck um, the flying chariot with a bolt, uh, a lightning bolt, and um, which was um, according to the myth killed Phaeton, but they don't say that he's necessarily dead. But that's what stopped um, the earth from burning uh, to the ground. Okay, so and then we're going to talk about Persephone or Proserpine, uh, like in as the Romans call her. She is. Um, Demeter's daughter and Hades' wife. She is the goddess of seasons and the goddess of the underworld. And um, last time I was gonna talk about this myth, this, this myth but we, uh, we ran out of time. So today we're gonna talk about it, which is the myth of Persephone's kidnapping. Um, during the Kahoot, I saw that a lot of you know about it already, but we're just gonna re-talk about it just in case any of you don't know. So, um, Hades was looking for a wife and then um, he saw Persephone and he wanted uh, Persephone to be his wife. So he asked um, Zeus, his brother, and Zeus said, okay, you can have Persephone as your wife. And then one day when Persephone was picking flowers, Zeus kidnapped her and brought her to the underworld where he's the king or yeah. And then uh, Demeter, her, uh, her mother became sad and depressed. So since Demeter is the goddess of agriculture and of nature, basically, um, nothing was growing. Uh, it, it kind of became like very, uh, very dark, very sad, and the earth just wasn't doing any good to the humans. And so there was, um, so um, Zeus told um, uh, Demeter that oh, your daughter is with Hades in the underworld. And she became so angry and she wouldn't um, let anything grow on earth. So at one point, Zeus was like, okay, this has to stop. So um, 
in the underworld, there is a law called the infernal law. If you eat anything in the underworld, then you can't come back. But since Persephone, uh, Persephone ate like uh, um, grains of uh, pomegranate, um, and it, it's not a lot, but it's not nothing either. So they made like, um, uh, uh, he's, so Zeus said, okay, so a Persephone can stay with Hades half of the year, and then he can, she can live with her mother the other half of the year. So basically, how this explains the seasons is during winter, winter is the time where Persephone is with Hades, so um, Demeter is sad. And then during spring, Demeter knows that her daughter is coming back, so everything starts to grow slowly. And then during summer, Persephone is with her mother, so she Demeter is happy. And then during autumn, Demeter knows that her daughter is leaving soon, so everything starts to become less um, green. Okay, so the next god we're gonna talk about is Aeolus. Aeolus is the god of winds and the divine keeper of the winds. So Aeolus lives um, on top of a mountain and on the bottom of the mountain, there's a big cavern. And in the cavern, there are the four winds or the animoi. So the first wind is Boreas. Boreas is the north wind. And then there's Zephyrus. Zephyrus is the west wind. Notice is the south wind, and Euros is the uh, is the east wing, uh, east wind. So these four winds are chained in a cavern underneath the mountain. And when Aeolus wants them to blow a certain way, they will let them out, and then they will blow their wind. So now we're going to talk about the deity of love. Deity of love is your uh, Eros or Cupid. Cupid, right? Like we normally talk about Cupid drinks in Valentine's Day, and it's like a baby with wings, with like heart arrows and stuff like that. But it's kind of more complicated than that. Even though Cupid is the god of love and his attributes are the bow, the quiver, the arrows, and the wings, we normally think that there are only one type of arrows, the type of arrow where you shoot somebody and the person fall in love with the first person you see. But that's not actually true. The, uh, the real uh, thing is that there are two sorts of arrows. There are one sort, uh, the, the first sort of arrow is, are the arrows in gold. The arrows in gold inspire love. So if Cupid shoots somebody with the arrows in gold, they will fall in love with the first person they see. But if the arrows are in lead, which is the other kind of arrow, it inspires disgust. So they will hate the first person they see for the rest of their lives. That's like the misconception that a lot of people have. So now we're gonna um, go on this link and we're gonna, this is the myth that National we're gonna Bank talk is about today. 18 to 24 year olds accounts with no monthly fees. That's 50 cents a day that stays in your pocket. Beauty. If you guys can't hear, just tell me. Beauty is a curse, Psyche thought, as she looked over the cliff's edge where she'd been abandoned by her father. She'd been born with a physical perfection so complete that she was worshipped as a new incarnation of Venus, the goddess of love. But real-life human lovers were too intimidated even to approach her. When her father asked for guidance from the Oracle of Apollo, the god of light, reason, and prophecy, he was told to abandon his daughter on a rocky crag where she would marry a cruel and savage, serpent-like, winged evil. Alone on the crag, Psyche felt Zephyr, the west wind, gently lifting her into the air. It set her down before a palace. You are home, she heard an unseen voice say. Your husband awaits you in the bedroom, if you dare to meet him. She was brave enough, Psyche told herself. The bedroom was so dark that she couldn't see her husband, but he didn't feel serpent-like at all. His skin was soft and his voice and manner were gentle. She asked him who he was, but he told her this was the one question he could never answer. If she loved him, she would not need to know. 
His visits continued night after night. Before long, Psyche was pregnant. She rejoiced, but was also conflicted. How could she raise her baby with a man she'd never seen? That night, Psyche approached her sleeping husband, holding an oil lamp. What she found was the god Cupid, who set gods and humans lusting after each other with the pinpricks of his arrows. Psyche dropped her lamp, burning Cupid with hot oil. He said he'd been in love with Psyche ever since his jealous mother, Venus, asked him to embarrass a young woman by pricking her with an arrow. But taken with Psyche's beauty, Cupid used the arrow on himself. He didn't believe, however, that gods and humans could love as equals. Now that she knew his true form, their hopes for happiness were dashed. So he flew away. Psyche was left in despair until the unseen voice returned and told her that it was indeed possible for her and Cupid to love each other as equals. Encouraged, she set out to find him. But Venus intercepted Psyche and said she and Cupid could only wed if she completed a series of impossible tasks. First, Psyche was told to sort a huge, messy pile of seeds in a single night. Just as she was abandoning hope, an ant colony took pity on her and helped with the work. Successfully passing the first trial, Psyche next had to bring Venus, the fleece of the golden sheep, who had a reputation for disemboweling stray adventurers. But a river god showed her how to collect the fleece the sheep had snagged on briars, and she succeeded. Finally, Psyche had to travel to the underworld and convince Proserpina, queen of the dead, to put a drop of her beauty in a box for Venus. Once again, the unseen voice came to Psyche's aid. It told her to bring barley cakes for Cerberus, the guard dog to the underworld, and coins to pay the boatman Charon to ferry her across the river Styx. With her third and final task complete, Psyche returned to the land of the living. Just outside Venus's palace, she opened the box of Proserpina's beauty, hoping to keep some for herself. But the box was filled with sleep, not beauty, and Psyche collapsed in the road. Cupid, now recovered from his wounds, flew to his sleeping bride. He told her he'd been wrong and foolish. Her fearlessness in the face of the unknown proved that she was more than his equal. Cupid gave Psyche ambrosia, the nectar of the gods, making her immortal. Shortly after, Psyche bore their daughter. They named her Pleasure, and she, Cupid, and Psyche, whose name means soul, have been complicating people's love lives ever since. Okay, so that was the video explaining um, uh, the myth of Cupid and Psyche. So does anyone have any questions on the video that we just saw? But if he hits someone with a golden arrow, then two years later, he hit the same girl with a the... Well, Joyce, I, I don't know what would happen, really. I don't know if that ever happened, I would think that um, then the arrow would change. Like if he struck the person with um, a lead arrow first and then he would struck the same person with a gold arrow, I think that the person would fall in love, but that's complicated. And yes, um, Carol said that was complicated. Yes, it's pretty, the, the story is pretty complicated but does anybody have any questions about the myth that we just saw? If no. Who was okay, so who was, okay. The goddess of death of the underworld is um, 
Persephone or our Proserpina that we just talked about her right over here. Yeah, you've heard of it in your Latin class. Yeah, so we talked about her right over here, sorry. She is the goddess of the underworld. The underworld is where all of the, the spirits of the dead live. So basically she's the goddess of death. Okay, so if nobody has any other questions, we're gonna continue with the marginal deities. Okay, so the marginal deities, we have um, Asclepius or Hepius. Last time I talked about Apollon, and then I was I told you guys that I was gonna talk about his son um, next week. So next week is today. So we're gonna talk about him today. So Asclepius is the god of medicine, or he is um, he basically does anything with medicine, and his attributes are the serpent entwined staff, which is right over here. But last time when I talk about Apollon, I talked about Caduceus. Does anyone see the difference between the Caduceus and the serpent intertwined staff? Anybody know? Yeah. Yeah, the wings is a big part of it. But if I can just find, maybe I can find the picture online. Just give me, hang on a second. Caduceus and um, wait, we're just gonna, sorry. Turn this down. This yeah, so this picture right here. So if everybody can see the picture right over here, the, there's a difference. So the caduceus is um, a stick with two snakes around it and with wings. But the rod of Asclepius is only a stick with a snake around it. So that's the difference. Okay, so, and then we're gonna go back to Asclepius. So, he has multiple children. Um, there are uh, Hygieia, Panai, Eagle, Asesso, and Yaso. Every single one of these has like a link with medicine, whether it's Hygieia because she's the goddess of cleanliness or Panai is the goddess that has a remedy to everything. Everything has like somehow a link to medicine. And so now we're gonna talk about the most important sanctuary of Asclepius. So the most important one is Epidor. Epidor is um, a sanctuary where um, people, uh, the sick people come and then they spend a night in the sanctuary and then they, uh, they sleep there. But the, the weird thing in the sanctuary is that the floor, the walls, everything is covered with snakes. So, um, because snakes represent Asclepius. So supposedly after, during your sleep in the sanctuary, um, Asclepius is supposed to come in your sleep and tell you how to cure yourself. That's what's supposed to happen. And apparently it works. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about uh, Janus, Panax, Genie, and Lars. Janus is a Roman God. So there is no equivalent in um, Greek, uh, yeah, uh, Greek mythology. So he is the uh, god of doors, passage, and transitions. And the month named after him is January because in Latin, um, January is generis. And then we have genie. Genie is like an invisible protector spirit. So everybody has a genie. When you, you're you born, a genie is born too. And when you die, the genie dies too. So it's basically your own personal like protector kind of during your life. And then we have the Panats. The Panats are the god protector of a city. And the Lars is equivalent, but the uh, they protect a certain family. So I see that we have questions. Isn't the serpent intertwined staff bodyguard? Isn't this? 
Um, uh, Carol, I'm not sure to understand your question. Okay. Okay, um, that's okay. We're just gonna continue. So this was my last slide. And like last time, there is, we have 10 minutes left and we're gonna do a Kahoot. So like last time, if you wanna go to kahoot.it, on your browser, whether it's Google, Safari, Chrome, Yahoo, or anything else. And then you'll enter the game pin that will be on my shared screen. Enter your nickname, look for your nickname on my shared screen, and then you can just wait for the game to begin. So I'm just gonna repeat, go to kahoot.it, and then enter the game pin that will be on my shared screen, just a second. And then you can enter, yeah. And then you can enter your um, your username or your nickname. And then you can just wait for the game to begin. So the game pin is seven zero nine one one three two. That's seven zero nine one one three two. Okay, um, it's it's okay if you um, if you weren't here in the last class. This Kahoot is basically um, what we learned today, so there won't be any questions on um, last classes, um, like subject or anything. So that's okay. I'm just gonna wait one or two minutes. So just go to kahoot.it, kahoot.it on your browser, enter your nickname, and then we can start after I see that most of you guys are on the Kahoot. So we have 23 attendees today. Now there's only nine people. So does anybody have any questions on how to get into the Kahoot? Because I see a lot of you aren't on here. If you don't want to participate, that's okay too, but there's 12 people, 13. Oh, sorry. I think I'm blocking the... A lot of people are leaving. I don't know if there's any problem. If there's a problem with the Kahoot, you can tell me. anyone still trying to join the Kahoot? Because there are still like 12, pe uh, 10 people missing. It always kicks me out. Okay. I'm not sure. I'm trying to join again. I don't know how that happens. Does that happen to a lot of people? Because if it does, I can try to restart it. I think I'm gonna wait one or two minutes just in case some people are still trying to get in the game. It's 
So is anyone trying to get in the game and they can't? Okay, so we're just gonna start. If you can't get in the game, you can um, look at my shared screen and try to answer them yourselves. So this time I put the questions and the answers on your screen too, and just in case you only have one screen. So other than being the god of vines and wine, Bacchus is the god of what? Just a reminder that the faster you answer the question, the more points you get. Yeah, so Bacchus is the god of theater. Okay, so next question. Good job to Ethan. So like I said, Earlier, the faster you answer the question, the more points you get. What is the difference between pan and phonus? This week's Kahoot is a little bit harder since I saw that you guys answered pretty well on the, um, last week's Kahoot. So the answer might be a little bit harder. If you don't know, you can just guess. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, so Pan is the god of shepherds, and Phonus, one of his many um, functions, is being the god of the countryside. Okay, so next question. Who are the female followers of Dionysus? Yeah, exactly. They are the maenads. The muse are the like the personification of arts. The furies are the goddess of vengeance. And um, even though um, maenads can also be called bacons, um, the 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 word in yellow isn't spelled correctly. So okay. So next question. There are nine muses that represent music. I think I kind of gave that away just a few seconds ago. Yeah, so that is false. There are nine muses that represent or personify the arts, like different kind of arts, whether it's music, theater, storytelling, poetry, or whatever. Okay, so our next question. What happened to Phaeton after he rode his father's chariot? Yeah, Zeus struck him with lightning and I think he died. I don't know anyone who wouldn't die after that. Okay, so. Which one of these wins is correctly associated with direction? Boreas, the, wind, the west wind, Nodos, the north wind, Zephyrus, the west wind, or Euros, the south wind. Yeah, Zephyrus is the west wind. Boreas is the north wind. Nodos is the, the, the uh, sorry, the south wind, and Euros is the east wind. Okay, so true or false? Euros and Cupid are this are two different deities. 
So are they the same person or not? The same God or not? Yeah. They are the same person, so the answer is false. Okay. Good job to eat then. You are still the first one. Okay, so. True or false, Asclepius is Apollon's son. I think this is a pretty easy question. Yeah, it is true. Okay. What happened in what happens in Asclepius's sanctuary? Yeah, Asclepius comes to see you in your sleep and tells you how to cure yourself, which is a pretty weird way, but apparently this is what happens. So let's see, let's see our scoreboard. Okay, so Ethan is still at the top and then we have someone named Peep and then we have Johnny. And so the last question is, what is the month named after Janus? Is it July, June, December, or January? Yeah, so most of you got it right. It is January. Okay, so that is that was the last question. So good job to Johnny. You are in third place. And then we have Peep. And then, so the first place is Ethan. So good job to you three. And then the runners up are Ja Hui and Aaron. Good job, guys. So I'm gonna stop here. And that's basically our class for today. Um, we're going to um, wait for your next class that starts in two minutes. So um, you guys can either go take a break, eat some food, drink some water, go to the washroom, and then we're gonna wait for, yeah, so Caden is here. So he can start his class or you guys can take like a two minute break. Okay, see you guys next week. And then we're gonna talk about the underworld next week. Who is the other teacher? Yes, it's Caden. He will talk about the animals. That's his subject.